This is going to be one of the trickiest days to do on video, but it is one of my favorite days of the whole semester. It's right up there with bad faith and so forth, but this is going to take a little bit of technological prowess on my part. I'm going to try to add notes. I'm going to try to insert videos as we go, right? This will be my greatest production yet, which means I am going to be humbled by how tough this is. So we are continuing with our discussion of human nature. So you should have at the ready your uh, human nature chart that we created. I will be trying to add a little bit of text to the video so I can show you what the order the obvious pieces of data that you should add to your chart. And be sure that you pause this video constantly. When I ask a question, please pause and think about the answer and write some notes about it, right? This will only work well if we really try to imitate the classroom experience. One more point I want to add, and this is a kind of a preview of something I plan to say at the end. As you're looking at your chart, we are looking at, right, the innate self versus the social self. But, hint, teaser, I'm wondering if we want to separate the social self into two categories. Maybe separate the social self into our normal private sort of social life versus our public social life, or even more specifically, how we act in institutions. So, the goal today is to talk about the very famous Milgram, Milgram experiments on obedience. Now, some of you are immediately afraid that I've already seen this video in my psych class or my social class, but please know, yes, many of you are familiar with the video, but very few people, even scholars in psychology, most likely your professor of psych or social, doesn't realize that this was the video was only one among 19 other variations of the experiment. So, yes, you might seem a little bored, right, when you're watching the video, but please know that the bulk of our discussion will be about the variations because you will get a completely different idea about human nature when you look at the variations. Let me also say something about why I choose this experiment over the others. Yes, the Ash experience, experiments on conformity, uh, the famous Zimbardo prison experiment on group conformity, those are very good, but Milgram is even better because he also includes those sorts of issues in his variations. So this is by far my favorite, and, right, Milgram is also a more subtle thinker. He is more widely read, and he is more eager to challenge his own assumptions. Another neat trivia tidbit is, by the way, the trial that you just read about Anderson, right? Now, if you checked, I changed his name. That was one of the, the words I checked in the transcript. So, Anderson was actually a key inspiration for the Milgram experiment. So, notice, this is coming full circle. Oh my gosh, Jeff is so well thought out. This is amazing planning. Yes. Good? All right. So, at this point, let's start watching the videos. As you're watching, pretend that you answered the ad and that you came to Yale and pretend that you got the slip of paper that says you are the teacher. So some other person you've never met shows up and they'll be learner. Try to watch the video and imagine your decisions and thoughts as you are the teacher in the experiment. It is May 1962. An experiment is being conducted in the Elegant Interaction Laboratory at Yale University. The subjects are 40 males between the ages of 20 and 50 residing in the greater New Haven area. They were obtained by a newspaper advertisement and direct mail solicitation. The subjects range in occupation from corporation presidents to good humor men and plumbers, and an educational level from one who had not finished elementary school to subjects who have doctorate and other professional degrees. Right here. Now, both of you have been paid, so let me sit right down. So let me say that the checks are yours simply for showing up at the lab. And from this point on, no matter what happens, the money is yours. Uh, I should like to tell both of you a little about the memory project. Psychologists have developed several theories to explain 
how people learn uh, various types of material. Uh, some of the better known theories are treated in the book over there, the teaching and learning process by Cantor. One theory is that people learn things correctly whenever they get punished for making a mistake. A common application to this theory would be when parents spank a child if he does something wrong. So what we're doing in this project is bringing together a number of adults of different occupations and ages, and we're asking some of them to be teachers and some to be learners. Uh, we want to find out just what effect different people have on each other as teachers and learners, and also what effect uh, punishment will have on learning in this situation. Uh, therefore, I'm going to ask one of you to be the teacher uh, here this afternoon, and the other be the learner. And the way we usually decide is to let you draw uh, from these two pieces of paper on which I've written the two uh, positions. If this is agreeable with both of you, we can do something. If you take one, please. You know the other. Would you open those and tell me which of you is which, please? Teacher. All right, now the next thing we'll have to do is set the uh, learner up so that he can get some sort of punishment. So, learner, would you uh, step out here with me, please? Uh, teacher, you may look on if you'd like while we get set up in here. Would you roll up your right sleeve, please? Left sleeve. That's fine. Now, what I'm going to do is strap down your arms to avoid any excessive movement on your part during the experiment. Is that too tight? That's all. Okay. This electrode is connected to the shock generator in the next room. And this electrode paste is to provide a good contact to avoid any blister or burn. All right, now let me explain to you, learner, exactly uh, what's going to happen and what you're supposed to do. The teacher will read a list of word pairs to you like these. Uh, blue girl, nice day, fat neck, and so forth. You are to try to remember each pair. For the next time through, the teacher will read only the first word or the first half of the word pair. For example, he will say blue. And then he'll read four other words, such as boy, girl, grass, hat. Now, your job is to remember which one of these four other words was originally paired with blue. And you indicate your answer by pressing one of these four switches. Now, can you reach those all right? That's fine. Now, if the first word I just read, boy, had been paired with blue, you press the first switch, and this will indicate to the teacher that you thought it was the first word. If you thought it had been the second word, girl, you'd press the second switch, and so forth for the third word, the third switch, the fourth word, the fourth switch. Now, if you get it correct, fine. If you make an error, however, you'll be punished with an electric shock. So, of course, it is to your advantage that you learn all these word pairs as quickly as possible. I think so. Uh, do you have any questions now before we go into the next room? Uh, no, but I think I should say this. Um about two years ago, I was in the Veterans Hospital in West Haven. Mm -hmm. And while there, they detected a heart condition. Nothing serious, but as long as I'm having these shocks, uh, how strong are they? How dangerous are they? Well, no, although they may be painful, they're not dangerous. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Uh, no, that's all. All right, teacher, would you take the test and be seated in front of the shock generator, please, in the next room? Mm -hmm. This machine... Uh, generates electric shocks. And when you press one of the switches all the way down, the learner gets a shock. When you release it, the shock stops, you see, like that. The switch will remain in this middle position after you've released it to show you which switches you've used on the board. Of course, if you were to press uh, any one of them again, the learner would get another shock. All subjects are given identical instructions and the sample shock. The machine is now on. To give you, the teacher, an idea of how much shock the learner is getting, we think it's only fair that you receive a sample shock yourself. Uh, are you agreeable with this? Certainly. I have to. Would you pull up your right sleeve a little bit, please? <coughs> no, All right. That's fine. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and estimate the number of volts you receive in the sample shock. 
Uh, do not open your eyes until I tell you to do so, please. You close them now. Okay, you may open your eyes and using the voltage scale uh, here, would you estimate for me the number of volts you receive, please? You may also use the verbal designation, slight, moderate, strong, so forth, to help you. Say a moderate. A number, please. Would you? About 75. 75. No, actually, it was 45 here. <clears throat> Although it may have seemed stronger because of the uh, electrode paste, which provides a perfect contact. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go on to our instructions. We will begin with this test. Uh, you will read each pair of words in this list once to the learner until you've read through the entire list. Direct your voice toward that microphone as the rooms are partially soundproof. After you've read through the list once, you'll go on to the next page. And here, starting from line A, you'll read the word in large letters along with each of the other words in the line. For example, in the first line, you read blue, boy, girl, grass, hat. Now, after you've read the four choices, the learner pushes one of the switches on the board in front of him. And the number he has selected will light up in this box, one, two, three, or four. Now, if he gives the correct answer, you say correct and go on to the next line. The correct answer is underlined and is also indicated in the right margin. Yeah. If he were to indicate the wrong answer, you would say wrong. Then tell him the number of volts you're going to give him. Then give him the punishment. Then read the correct word pair once. And then go on to the next line. For example, if he indicated three for blue, you would say wrong. Fifteen volts. You press and release the switch. Read blue girl, and then go on to the next line. Oh, I see. That's right. Now, each time he gives a wrong answer, you move up one switch on the shock generator. I see. And it's important that you follow this procedure exactly. So to help you, uh, let me go through it again very quickly. All right. I would suggest you read the list and the test at a brisk pace to keep it moving. All right. And, of course, we'll begin with 15 volts for the first wrong answer. Okay. Do not begin until I say ready, begin, please. Attention, uh, learner, your teacher is about to begin the test. Try and remember the word pairs. Ready? Begin, please. All right, so let's pause right there. Uh, let's just highlight a few things about the setup. Uh, please notice that every teacher is given a sample shock at 45 volts. It feels a lot stronger because the connection is so good. So now, we are, I want you to focus on one subject, right? Well, what we will keep calling the guy in the white shirt. I want you to pay attention to this guy because he is almost completely average. Not only in his overall behavior, but also in his body language and to the things he says to the experimenter. Wrong. 90 volts. Wrong, volts, 135, ants a woman, and white cloud, horse, rock, house, answer, wrong, 150 volts, answer, horse. Continue, please. Go right on. Right. The experiment requires you continue, teacher. Please continue. The next word is sad. Do I make you going? Continue, please. Oh, sad. Sad. Face, music, clown, girl. Correct. Next one, short. Sentence, movie, skirt, time. Answer, please. Wrong. Under 65 volts. Time. Continue, please. Go on. Conditioned that. You want me to go? Just continue, please. Sh 
sharp axe needle stick blade. Ask blade. Wrong. I'm up to 180 volts. Please continue, teacher. Needle, you're gonna get a shot. 180 volts. I'm not gonna kill that man, do you? you hear him hollering? He's they said before, the shocks may be painful, but yeah, they're not but dangerous. Yeah, they're hollering. He can't stand it. What if something happens to him? The experiment requires that you continue, teacher. Yeah, but uh, I'm not gonna get that man sick in there. I mean, he's hollering in there. You know what I mean? I mean, <laughs> he's Whether the learner likes it or not, we must go on until well, he's learned I mean, all the uh, words here. I'd refuse to take the responsibility of getting hurt in there. I'm not, I mean, he's under hollering. It's absolutely essential that you continue, teacher. There's too many left here, and I mean, geez, he, go, he gets wrong here. There's too many of them left. I mean, who's going to take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. All right, next one, slow. Off dance, truck, music. Answer, please. Wrong. 195 volts. Dance. Oh. Let me out of here. Let me out of here. Continue, please. Let me out of here. You have no right to keep me here. Let me out. Let me out. Let me out of here. My eyes bother me. Let me out. Let me out. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Well, the experiment requires well, you to I mean, continue. I know it does, sir, but I mean, <laughs> you don't know what he's getting in for. He's up to 195 volts. Answer, please. Wrong. 225 volts. The word is noise. No. House, pet, book, name. Answer, please. Correct. Next one, quiet. Song, party, child, evening. Correct. Next one, tame. Wolf, bear, dog, cat. Wrong. <coughs> Answer is bear. 240 volts. Next one, sweet. Nice. No, you go back up to the beginning of that page and go through it again until he's learned them all correctly. Oh, no. No, I'm not going to kill that man. Do you mean I got to keep going up with the scale? No, sir. He's already there. I'm not going to give him 450 volts. The experiment requires that you continue. I know continue. it does, but that man is hollering in there, sir. As I said before, although the shocks may be painful, yeah, they're not but dangerous. I mean, he's, he's yelling in there. Start with blue, please, at the top of the page. Continue, please, teacher. What do I tell him? We're going over it again? No, just, just go ahead. Blue. Boy. Girl grass hat. Correct. Nice. Day, sky, job, chair. Wrong. Answer is day. 285 volts. Continue, please. Fat. Man, lady, tub, neck. Answer, please. Wrong. Answer is neck. 300 volts. Continue. The next word is green, please. Green. Grass, hat, ink, apple. If the learner doesn't answer in a reasonable time, about four or five seconds, consider the answer wrong and follow the same procedure as you have been doing for wrong answers. Say wrong, tell them the number of votes, give them the punishment, read them the correct answer.
Continue, please. Uh, green. Grass, hat, ink, apple. Answer, please. Go on with the procedure, please, teacher. 315 volts. The answer is ink. Next one. Well, you gotta keep getting a shock if you don't answer. The next one is rich. 330 volts. Excellent, fast. Bird, car, train, plane. Go on, please. With the please answer. The answer is bird. 345 volts. Blunt, knife, stick, word, arrow. Answer, please. Continue, please. The answer is arrow. 360 volts. Go on, please, with the experiment. Please continue. Soft, rug, pillow, hair, grass. Answer, please. Go on, teacher. Hair, 375 volts. I think something's happened to that fellow in there. I don't get no answer. He was hollering a less voltage. Can't you check in and see if he's all right, please? Not once we've started. Please continue, teacher. Cool, day, shade, water, cave. Answer, please. Are you all right in there? Are you all right? Please continue, teacher. Oh, you know, I keep giving them shocks. Continue, please. I'm up to 390. Continue, please. Something's happened to that man in there. Nice one. Gold, dollar, necklace, moon, paint. Something's happened to that man in there. You better check in on him, sir. He won't answer me or nothing. Please uh, continue. Go on, please. You accept all the responsibility? The responsibility is mine. Correct. Please go on. Gold, dollar, necklace, moon, paint. Answer, please. Are you all right? 405 volts. The answer is moon. I'm actually hard. Stone, head, bread, work. Answer, please. The answer is head, 420 volts. Next one, wet, night, grass, duck, cloth. The answer is duck, 435 volts. It says danger, severe shock here. Next X on the next one. Continue, please. 435 volts. Next one, brave, woman, soldier, dog, horse. Answer is woman, 450 volts. That's it. Now continue using the last switch on the board, please, the 450 switch for each wrong answer. Continue, please. I'm not getting no answer. Please continue. The next word is white. Don't you think you should look in on them, please? Not once we've started the experiment. But what if something's happened to a man that hadn't attacked or something there? The experiment requires that we continue. Go on, please. Don't, uh, don't the man's health mean anything? Whether the learner likes it or not, we but must... But he might be dead in there. I mean, some people can't take this shock, sir. Please I mean, continue. I don't tend to be rude, but I mean, I think you should look in on him. Whether I mean, all you got to do is look in the door. I don't get no answer, no noise. Something I think has happened to the gentleman in there, sir. We must continue. Go on, please. You're going to keep giving him, what, 450 volts every shot now? That's correct. Continue. The next word is white. White, 
Cloud, horse, rock, house. Answer, please. The answer is horse, 450 volts. Next word, sad, face, music, clown, girl. The answer is face, 450 volts. Next one is short, sentence, movie, skirt, time. All right, excuse me, teacher. We'll have to discontinue the experiment. I'd like to ask you, how do you feel about it? I feel all right, but I don't like what's happened. That I fall in there, he's been hollering, and we had to keep giving him shocks. I didn't like that one bit. I mean, he, he wanted to get out, and he just kept going, kept throwing 450 volts. I didn't like that. He wouldn't even look at on that gentleman. Well, who was actually pushing the switch? I was. But he kept insisting. I told him no, but he said, he got to keep going. I told him it's time we stopped when we got up to uh, 195, 210 volts. But why didn't you just stop? He wouldn't let me. I wanted to stop. I kept insisting to stop, but he says no. Okay, let me tell you, first of all, that this is not essentially an experiment in memory and learning. Uh, it's an experiment in which we are looking at your reaction to taking orders. And Mr. Williams gave you those orders to go on according to schedule. Uh, the gentleman in there was not actually getting shocked. He was not getting shocked at all. Oh, you mean he wasn't getting nothing? He is part of the act. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm telling you. I mean, I was getting upset here. I mean, I was getting ready to walk out. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. All right. So that is, in a shortened form, the video that most people have seen, or many people have seen, in their other classes. And pause here and think what would be your ideas of human nature if this was the only version of the experiment that you were witnessing? What would we say about human nature after watching that? I'm assuming that most people would say, it looks like our, the, innate, the innate self is experiencing a lot of strain or hardship, right? They're stressed out. They don't want to do this. They're looking for an excuse to get out of it. So maybe you would say that the innate self shows some kind of sympathy or something like this. But then you would say, and this is the point in psych and social classes, the social self is apathetic, maybe even selfish, and they just terrify us. Look at what they will do when they're given commands. Good. So far, so good. So now, keep going with your chart, because I want to give you the history of many of the different variations. Good. So, Keep thinking about the questions I'm asking. I would love it if you would pause and write down your possible answers to this. Good? And so, let's start. First, let me summarize what happens with experiments one and two. Because, and this is key, the video that you've just watched, and the one that is really famous, is actually variation five. I don't know why people don't realize this and then get curious about the other variations. But the video is variation five, so let me first summarize what happens in what happened in the very first two variations that he tried before he got to the variation number five in the video. In the very first variation, variation one, he started the experiment, and by the way, he asked, before he started this experiment, he asked of all of his colleagues in psychology across the nation, actually internationally, what they thought the results of this experiment would be. Experiment number one was fairly similar to number five. I'll show you how it's different. And what was the absolute shared response? That only sociopaths, about one and a half to two percent of the population, would go all the way through to the end on this experiment, would actually see someone die as a result of their actions. Good? So, Milgram starts with experiment number one, given these assumptions that he shared about who would be able to go all the way through this. In experiment number one, think of experiment number five in the video, and all you have to change is there's no microphone and no mention of a heart problem at the beginning. What happens? Result, right? The result is actually the same as in experiment number five, and this freaked Milgram out. He said, how on earth did we get, as you saw, 65% obedience 
like in the white t-shirt video example. 65%, so let's make that more uh, terrifying. Two thirds of you would kill an ordinary person if a person you met the same day in authority wearing a white coat, right, told you to keep shocking the person and they end up dying. Oh, sorry, interesting little trivia point. The guy in the white jacket, the white lab coat in the experiment, wasn't even a part of Yale. It was a local high school teacher that Milgram hired to do this. He looks a little serious and a little cold, but he's not even a Yale experimenter. It's just an actor from a local high school, a local high school math teacher, I believe. In experiment number two, they added an, a microphone. What happened? No change. Well, slight change. They got 63% obedience, meaning 63% of the people went to the very end and even repeated the 450 volts at the end. Now, what I want you to do is think in each of these variations, what sort of aspect of our social psychology is he isolating? Because these are the usual assumptions we make. In variation number three, now, imagine in each variation that we're back to the video scenario and I will simply tell you what is different. In situation number three, variation three, they did one simple shift. They moved the learner into the same room as you, the teacher. So the subject is now sitting at another desk. So if you imagine them in my office, you are here working at the shock generator, pretend it's my computer, and then over there at another desk, is the learner working on the questions, but they are strapped down like they are in the video and they can push their buttons for their answer. But now we can hear them even clearer. It's not through any microphone. We can hear them directly. They're within arm's reach of us right over there. So what is happening in a way is we're imitating what Smith said about the Chinese earthquake example. If something happens at a distance and doesn't seem connected to us, then we don't really think much about the victims. We feel bad for a little bit, and then we go on with our lives. Well, so what is Milgram doing in situation three? In variation three, he's reduced the distance. Instead of them being in another room, that's at least a little bit of distance, they're right there. And so what's the result of this reduced distance? I'm sure you're thinking, here we go. Now we've got a key factor. Obedience will drop a ton. Sadly, it doesn't drop as much as you think. The new number, 40%. Four out of 10 people would kill someone even though they can directly see what's happening to them, that they're shocking them, leads directly to the results and they're hearing the screaming in the same room, 40%. So now let's look at variation four. In variation four, they have Milgram has tinkered with distance even further, and in fact, he gets fairly radical in his removing of distance. So, in variation three, the learner was in the same room. Now, the learner is right next to you. And, this is crazy, not only is he next to you and he's strapped down in his chair like you saw in the video for variation five, now the shock generator is connected to a shock plate. So let me try to demonstrate this. So right next to you at your desk, here you are asking questions, working to the shock generator, and right next to you is now the learner. And the learner is strapped down, but their hand is on, an, on a shock plate connected to the shock generator. But notice, they can move their hand off the shock plate. So what happens when you get to voltage 150? Remember, like in, the, in variation five in the video, they are following the script. They are trying to make the learner's reactions the same for all of the new teachers brought in. So when we reach 150 volts, what does the learner do? Well, obviously they just refuse to put their hand up. So they lift it off. And what does the experimenter say? It is required that they receive their punishment for a wrong answer. Please, teacher, make sure they receive their shock for the wrong answer. What do you have to do as teacher? You have to make sure, literally, hold their hand down to the shock plate. Of course, if you know anything about electricity, what are you thinking? You are thinking, well, if I hold their hand down, I'm going to receive the shock, and so you're going to know right away that this doesn't work. 
This is what is insane. Through the best coincidence in the world, what happened was an electrical engineer actually showed up for variation number four. And they went very far through the experiment. They went into the high 200s in terms of voltage. And after the experiment was over, they asked this very issue. And here is what the electrical engineer said. Yes, I thought that I would feel the shock as well, but I assumed you knew more about, you knew more about these issues than I did. Notice how incredible that is psychologically. This expert in electricity thought, right, I shouldn't do my own thinking here. I should just assume that the experimenter in the lab coat knows, knows more than I do, so I'll shut off that part of my brain. All right, so back to the shock plate. So what would you do? How far would most people, you, go in obeying the experimenter and literally force the person's hand so that they were shocked and continued this all the way until they were dead? How many of you? Answer, 30%. Close to a third of ordinary people would kill someone even if they have to participate in getting them shocked to their deaths. And so now, if we're following this chronologically, we would arrive at variation number five that's in the video. So we've already seen that. The results were 65%. But let me just underscore that from here on out, this experiment is even more controlled than in the variations one through four. Because now they start using a recording for the learner's answers, for the learner's screams, for their protests. For purposes of time, right, so you're not having to stare at me for over an hour, we, I will cut to just the most significant variations, right? Uh, so let's skip ahead to experiment variation number seven. In number seven, what happens is the experimenter stages a phone call. So you, we set up the experiment, you're the teacher, we set it up, and then a phone call comes in, and here's what he is saying. Oh, really? Right now? but I'm in the teaching learning experiment. Oh, okay, I'll be right there. So and then he turns to you and he says this to the teacher. I have to go upstairs to help with some other work in another lab. Here is my phone number. If anything goes wrong, please call me. But you continue with the experiment as you are told. Keep escalating shocks for wrong answers. I will be back soon. So what's happening? Milgram is now isolating a different sort of distance. Now it's the distance to the authority figure. The authority figure is not immediately in the room anymore. So now, what changes when authority is removed? They are out of the room. How many of you would continue to kill the person now that the authority left the room, but all of the other situations are the same? Answer, 21%. Yay! Milgram is excited. He is still not isolating just sociopaths, but now 80% of you would stop from killing the person because the authority figure is gone. So the key is not the distance to the victim or the subject. It is now the distance to authority. When authority is not reminding us to continue, we start more often to think for ourselves and, hint, do what we actually want to do. Then Milgram, in Variation 10, does something, again, brilliant. I love this guy. He takes everything about the original situation in 5 and simply moves the whole lab to a storefront. Now it has no connection to Yale. And what you are told as you enter and they set up the teaching learning experiment is they tell you that this is now a business research firm just getting data for business. So the integrity, the famous name of Yale, is not mentioned at all. What happens? So what have we done? What Milgram has done now is now reduced the legitimacy of the authority. Instead of removing authority, because now the lab coat is in the room, but the lab coat is now not thought to be, although that is fake, as I told you before, is not thought to be a Yale experimenter, but someone that we don't really know how good their legitimacy is. This is business research. What happens? Now again, back to the baseline of 65. So how does it change from that baseline? Because it's away from Yale. Answer, 48% total obedience. That's a big deal. 
All that's changed is Yale. So it tells me that people are paying attention to how legitimate their authority is. So if I'm a subject in some cruel experiment like this, I at least can think, I hope they consider whether they should trust that authority figure. That gives me some hope. And this brings us to my absolute favorite of all the variations. My favorite is variation number 11. In this case, back to the situation in the video, we're back at Yale, everything is at the baseline number five, variation five, except the instructions are now a little different. The authority figure, the lab coat guy, right? Actually high school teacher, we don't know that. He says, all right, let's set up the experiment, but there is one thing that you can decide. You decide what you want the maximum shock to be. We do want to see what effect more punishment has on learning and memory, but you decide what is the highest shock value, and when you think it's at a high enough pain threshold, you just keep repeating that same number. So if you decide that 250 is enough, just repeat 250 for each wrong answer after they've reached 250. Now, I imagine what most of you are thinking is, in a society like ours, the voltage at 150, when they say, let me out, that seems like a natural place that most people would say, okay, I will stop at 150, that's when they want out. Good, but let's look what actually happens. Because what we've actually got is we've got a teacher or a person in an authority situation that is given a tiny bit of responsibility, or they are given a little bit of freedom to choose at least some small thing. And so now they're going to think about that choice. How many of you would go all the way? Or to be more careful in this condition, how, how high of a voltage would you go to before you say, that's the maximum I will use? Finally, Milgram gets what he was looking for. Finally, we have the variation in which only sociopaths go all the way. He got a little lucky statistically, if you can call that luck. He did get 3% of the teachers going all the way, a little luck just in the stats, and, but it was only sociopaths. Now, let's pause for a second to make sure that word is clear. In movies, they will often conflate the two ideas of the sociopath and the psychopath. The psychopath is an incredibly rare idea. Very few people in the world are psychopaths. These are people that are sadistic. They love hurting other people. They will hide all of their harms. They know something is wrong with them and they enjoy it and they go crazy. Now, a sociopath is a much more common phenomenon. It is, as I suggested, one to two percent of the population. This means the vast majority of people that are sociopaths have no idea that they are sociopaths. They act and, and think very normal. What is the difference? The sociopath is the person who doesn't feel guilt when they hurt other people. They have normal experiences as a normal citizen, but if they find themselves especially killing someone, they don't feel as bad as non-sociopaths do. So most people will never know if they have this trait unless they find themselves in some crazy situation like a war. And then what will they find? Oh my gosh, everyone else is drinking themselves into a stupor. They can't sleep at night because of all the guilt they feel over killing someone. And I'm fine. That's the kind of situation where you would realize something is wrong with me. I don't experience guilt. All right. So what we find in variation 11 is not only, right, do teachers stop before killing, the data is amazing. In variation 11, let me look it up really quick, over half of the teachers don't even get past the 60 volt threshold. Remember, the sample voltage that you were given was a 45 volt example. And that hurt a little bit, but it was not a big deal. And so what must be happening is people are saying, okay, I should stop at about 45. That's enough harm. They don't even hear the person grunt. They don't even, and so I think they maybe say, okay, I can go one volt higher. I'll go to the next volt on the scale, 60 volts. Note also, only 8% of the participants, only 8% of the teachers 
even get to 150 volts and hear the person say, let me out. They are stopping before the person even asks us to stop. So let's pause at this point. Variation 11 should radically change what you're thinking about human nature, especially what you're thinking about our innate self. The social self right now can be fairly up in the air, but we would say, what do people do when they are allowed a choice about how much to hurt someone? What do they do? Well, they feel a little obliged, I would think, to participate in the experiment a little bit. But the vast majority of people won't hurt someone beyond what they themselves would want to experience in the experiment if they, I'm assuming, were the subject. That changes everything for me. For variation 12, I'm going to change things up a little bit. What I'm going to do is I'm going to explain what is happening in situations 12 and 14 because they get to similar psychological, sociological effects. And so I won't give you the results until we've talked about both. But again, please try your best to, let's pretend this is like a game show, try your best to guess what the percentage is when you think about these psychological and sociological factors that he's isolating. So, in variation number 12, what he does is we, he has, again, remember, the learner is an actor, but this time they have the actor act differently. They have the actor, the learner, be anxious to receive shocks. Here's the basic story that he tells you. He says, my buddy was in this experiment and he gave up pretty early. He couldn't stand the pain. So I have told him, almost a dare, that I'm going to get farther than him. So notice what's going to happen. When at, say, 150 volts, when a normal learner says, okay, let me out of here, this hurts too much, my heart is bothering me, this new learner is going to say, keep going, ouch, ouch, yes, that really hurt, but I can do farther, please, let's continue. And here, the experimenter is going to do something different. At 150 volts, the experimenter is going to say, okay, that's enough punishment, let's stop the experiment. So you have to decide, do I listen to the learner and keep going, or do I listen to the authority figure and stop? In situation 14, here's what happens. They have the learner, the actor, say, I am too worried about my heart before I start this. I don't think I should be doing this. So I'm too worried. I am so sorry. I can't participate, right? Of course, what does the experimenter say? The money is yours just for showing up. You don't have to continue. That's fine. You know what we'll do? Here's this neat idea. I, myself, the experimenter says, haven't tried this experiment myself. I want to see how well I can learn and remember when I'm experiencing these shocks. So let's go into the other room here. Everybody help strap me down into the shock generator chair, and I will run the experiment myself. You, the original learner here, you can just sit over there in the back of the room. You can just be a bystander. Okay, let's try this. So now no notice what happens. And notice, we are back to the original script of variation five, and so what will the experimenter, now sitting in the learner chair, do when they get to 150 volts? They will follow the script and say, let me out. So here you go. What are we going to do? Are we going to follow through with the experiment or listen to the learner this time and say, and now notice, he is the dude in the lab coat. So in both 12 and 14, the lab coat is telling us to do something. So what do you think the result of 14 says? Both of these are the only case in which we have total obedience. Now let me understand. Total obedience in this case means doing what the experimenter says, stopping at 150 volts. And what do people do? They stop at exactly 150 volts. Now it becomes interesting to look back and think not about the other examples in terms of how many people killed, but how many people disobeyed in all the cases. In the baseline scenario, you had 65% obedience, meaning they killed because the experimenter told them to continue. But notice, now I'm looking at my heroes, the 35% of those people who said, no, I won't do it. I'm not listening to you, experimenter. I'm not going to continue. Well, here, they listen to the experimenter and, and obey at a perfect clip. All of the participants, all of the teachers, all of you 
would stop when the experimenter says stop at 150 volts. What does this mean? It means, think about it. Well, here, try a, an analogy. If I tell my son, son, eat as much fast food as you want, you have no curfew, stay out as late as you want, and you know what? Don't get a lot of sleep. Stay up late watching YouTube videos or playing Call of Duty, right? I actually, I want you to do those things. Please play Call of Duty. Please don't get much sleep. Be on your phone way too much. Don't do your homework. Don't read. You just goof off. That's what I demand. Will my son do it? Of course. Why? Because that's what he wants to do. That's what he wants to do automatically. So what's the key here? The key to getting total obedience is tell people what they want to hear. Notice. In my estimation, these teachers are miserable. They don't want to hurt anybody. Think of it, variation 11. They don't want to hurt. When you say you can stop when you want, they do. In this case, the experimenter, the authority is saying, stop hurting them. What do they do? Yes, please. That's what I wanted to do the whole time. I hated hurting people. If this is a game show, variation 16 is the one where the host of the game show is just a bastard because this one is tricky. It does teach us something interesting, but I could not figure this out myself. I was baffled on, on what to do with this. Here is the idea. Now we have a similar situation as we did in 12 or 4, sorry, sorry, as we did in number 14, where the learner is worried about their heart too much and so they don't want to continue. In this case, instead of the experimenter getting in the chair, the experimenter calls up another part of the psychological laboratories at Yale and asks if there's any subjects available. And who comes down? One of the other lab coats. So now it's not an ordinary civilian. We have another authority figure as our learner. So the original authority figure, the original lab coat guy is in his normal position in five, as in variation five, but what's changed? The identity of the subject. Now the subject that we will be asking questions to and shocking for wrong answers is an authority figure himself, a dude wearing a lab coat that we strap into the chair. What happens? So notice what's being isolated here. Now we have a dilemma about what is important to us. Is the authority figure important or does it change when we have the different identity of the subject of the victim? The victim is now also an authority figure. So what do you do? How many of you would go all the way and kill an authority because another authority is telling you to? How many of you? 65%. Isn't that crazy? We are back to the baseline scenario. The identity of the victim doesn't matter to us. We know who the authority figure is. There they are right over there, and we obey that authority. This makes me think that the identity of victims doesn't matter that much. People think, for instance, would you have liked to see a variation, sorry, Milgram didn't do this, where they change the identity of the learners, where they have children as learners, or a granny, or a mom, or just a regular woman as learners. Now, he didn't do that, but I don't think it would change all that much. I think it would freak us out to find that if the authority is intact, we will harm anyone if we feel like we have to. Now, that brings to mind some other issues that I wanted to consider, and one that he did bring in as a variation. This is technically variation eight, but I think it fits well here. In variation eight, Milgram had only female teachers. He wanted to see what effect the gender identity of the teacher would have on their obedience to harm the subject. Now, if you're thinking about this, and I hope you are really being baffled by all of these ideas, you're thinking, what change should a female make to the reaction psychologically? I'm assuming that there are two things you're considering in your head. First, you're thinking of, well, women tend to be more sensitive more compassionate toward the needs of others, they feel things more strongly, so that should make it so that the female subjects are more disobedient. They are more worried about other people than jerk men are. At the same time, though, there's the other side. The other side is, this is 1961, 
And socially, women were a lot more obedient, taught to be a lot more quiet, quiet, taught to be more deferring to authority figures, especially men. So, how does this battle work itself out? The answer? Females. How many of you would kill someone if an authority figure told you to keep shocking them till they die? Answer? 65%. We are back to the original number of the baseline. What does this say? Now, I interpret this as meaning that females are humans like every other human, male or female. Human nature doesn't, doesn't change with gender, but experiences change, but I guess the behavior doesn't. What do we find that is different? You do see more expressed emotion, more stories told about how bad the women feel as they're hurting the subject, but the behavior is identical. Now, this is terrible, but let me tell you a different experiment. Now, the original experiment that Milgram did was repeated with over a thousand different subjects in different parts of the world, in different psychology departments, with almost identical results. Later, as we thought more about these experiments, a, a bit more ethical work was done by philosophers, and they realized that this is too traumatic for these teachers to go through. Yes, they soon realized they didn't hurt anybody, but they really felt like they did at the time. And so we changed experimental ethics. So now when people try to redo this experiment, they can't make people think they are killing another human being. But let me bring up one very interesting new variation. This variation had both men and women as teachers, but the subject was a puppy. They had, for some reason, you had to shock the puppy if it didn't do something. And notice, now please be careful, right? I am so sorry. They did not in any way escalate the shocks of the puppy. All they did is had the puppy's cage have a metal steel floor, and then they would have a very small shock come up through the floor. And so the puppy, very sensitive paws, would scream out. And when you think as teacher in this experiment that you are escalating shocks on the shock generator, it's really giving the puppy this same really, really tiny shock. But because the puppy is now getting frustrated, he doesn't know what's happening, he is starting to whine and cry even more. So the, learn, they're sorry, so the teachers are thinking these are escalating shocks. Again, why do I bring up this terrible experiment? This is the only experiment where the differences between the results of men and women as teachers was different. And it's the opposite of what you're thinking. Men refused to shock the puppy at high levels, at about the, uh, at about the results we get in Milgram, but women, almost all of them, shocked completely. They did not refuse to shock the puppy as much as men did. I have no idea why, but that's in incredibly fascinating. I'm sorry I had to bring that in. Variations 17 and 18 are my third and second favorite of all the variations. 11 is my favorite. In 17, we are now bringing in the issue of conformity and group dynamics or peer pressure. And so this is one of the reasons why I like this even better than Zimbardo, because that's all the Stanford Prison experiment was isolating, was social pressure. Here's what happens. In variation 17, when you show up at the lab, there are four people there. And three of you are selected as teacher, and one is selected as learner. Now, the learner, as you know, is an actor. And the other teachers in Variation 17 are also actors, but you don't know that. And so the teachers are giving different, sorry, the teachers are given different chores in the teaching learning experiment. One person is reading the question, the other person is working the shock generator, and the other person is writing down what the right and wrong answers were. So here's what happens in 17. The actors disobey. One actor disobeys at 150 volts. As you could imagine, they say, they don't want to be here anymore. I can't do this. You don't need three teachers. And the experimenter obliges just fine. No problem. We don't need three teachers. Here, I'll record the right and wrong answers. The other two continue. The second actor disobeys. I think it's at 250, about that many volts, and says, you don't need two teachers either. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm out. 
experiment or notice is still saying the things they say in, in variation five. The experiment requires you to continue, but they accommodate this guy as well. And so no problem, as long as one of you continues the experiment, then we can continue the experiment here. I will do the other chores. You simply ask the questions and run the shock generator. Well, so what happens in this case? We now have peers, we have group conformity, but they disobey. So how many of you in this situation would continue by yourself and shock all the way until they are dead? Answer, 10%. That freaks me out a little bit, but notice what's happened. And here is what I think are the key indicators. You have seen people like you disobey. And I don't know what we imagine happens when we disobey authority, but we notice that they weren't screamed at, they weren't beaten, they weren't killed for disobeying. They were forgiven. They were allowed to disobey. Now, the experimenter wasn't happy, but they got away with it. So I can get away with it, so I can act like them. Perhaps you could also say there are other factors involved, such as, oh, wow, those other people are decent people. I better act like them or they might think I'm a jerk. Or maybe you were just waiting for an example of disobedience and you were waiting to act. So 90% of you found that to be a good enough reason to finally be courageous enough to disobey and stop the experiment. Situation 18 is my second favorite of all of them. Go back to situation 17, experiment five, except there are two actors on a team with you as teacher. And these teachers act like most people. They protest a little bit, they don't seem happy, but they continue through, they follow your lead. If you stay in, they stay in. And so you have a team of teachers acting in conformity. How many of you in a team of teachers would continue all the way through to the end and shock this guy until he's dead? Let me just say, when you all said, when I asked the reading question, I wouldn't kill someone, someone if an authority figure told me to, you are big fat liars. Result, 93% of you would have killed this person you just met, did nothing wrong to you, just because you're obeying authority and other people are obeying authority. Now, what do I want to do with this? Can we easily get the obedience, or sorry, sorry, can we easily get obedience up to 99% or 100% by adding a few more factors? Sure. Let's add you're wearing a uniform, so you, you teachers are all together with an identity. We could add some training or ideological training, telling you how important Yale is, how important the experiment is. Let's make it even better. Let's make the learner some sort of outgroup identity. Make them someone you don't naturally like. Make them someone that's nothing like you at all. Or, and they did this in, an, in a later experiment, tell you things bad about the learner, that they beat their kids or beat their wife or their Let's go to back to the Bush days. They're an Al-Qaeda terrorist or something. Now, I think obedience would become almost perfect. Most people would kill in that sort of a situation. So what conclusions can we draw from, from human nature based on the Milgram experiments? Now, first of all, I think, if you watch the video carefully, we can rule out selfishness almost immediately. Now, let me be very careful. Was the teacher enjoying themselves? Were they doing this for some direct or obvious benefit? No. The teachers were miserable. When allowed to stop, they stopped, right? When told, please stop, they did. When given maximum shock, they jumped at the chance and stopped way down the shock generator levels. So, what can we say, though, about the innate self? I think this is where you see a bunch of strain between what the social self is expected to do and what we truly want to do as human beings at our core. I think these experiments would say at least sympathetic, maybe even some sort of compassionate nature is what we are really like. What about the social self? And here's where I want to get a little sneaky. I think, as I said at the very beginning of this whole lecture, we should distinguish between a social self, which could be a lot of things, and a self within an institution, especially an institution with hierarchies 
or obedience. I think the institutional self can be anything the institution wants it to be. As we saw with the electrical engineer, I think the institutional self even adopts the mindset of the authority. So, if we create an institution like the Red Cross or Doctors Without Borders, I think the institutional self could be a saint. If we adopt a completely in different institutional self, say a Nazi, I think you could get the self to be sadistic, at least selfish. Terrifying. <laughs> Damn. Lastly, let's talk about the conclusions Milgram drew. What Milgram did, right, in his book on obedience, which again, I don't know why psych and social teachers aren't reading, is he said, I can come up with, through this experiment, five conditions that would produce perfect obedience, like in the experiment. Sorry, not perfect, but very traumatizing levels of obedience. There are five conditions you need. All you have to do is, is enact these five factors in a situation, and people are apt to obey, like we saw in the video. Condition one, absorb the subject in a technical task. In short, give them something to focus on so they won't be focused on their victims. How did we see this earlier in the class? Heidegger's ready to hand the situation. What, do you, what is Dasein like when they're in a ready to hand task? Well, everything else fades into the background. Their victim fades into the background, the tools fade into the background, be, background because we're focused on the task. Condition number two is to provide an authority figure that you, the subject, sees as responsible for everything that's happening. This case is fairly obvious and you saw it with the white t-shirt guy. Condition number three, shift the atmosphere to what Milgram says, and the wording is a little weird. He says, shift the moral sense to obedience. In other words, create a condition or an atmosphere where there's a clear hierarchy that there's someone in charge and the other person has to ask them what to do, has to be polite. You see the guy in the white shirt constantly saying, I am so sorry, and saying, sir, right? I don't mean to be a tr trouble, sir. So you get this shift. Condition number four is providing a justifying institution or project that in some way can justify the harms crazy. In the case of the experiment, what do you have? You have two obvious ones. You have Yale University and experimenting on science. And so science and Yale become justifying institutions. You can think in terms of, say, warfare, all sorts of justifying institutions. My country, my flag, uh, freedom, whatever it is. Socialism, democracy, whatever, uh, whatever institution you think you're supporting. Condition number five is, and this one is subtle, leave room for devaluing the victim. Now notice I said leave room for. You don't have to devalue the victim yourself because the subjects will. And notice that this is a rationalization. You aren't devaluing as an active reason for hurting them. You find yourself obeying authority and hurting the victim, and then you come up with a rationalization. Oh, they deserved it, or let's get really crazy. Oh, they're a different race. They're a different religion. They deserve it somehow. Terrifying. Now, later scholars have added two more conditions that they see in the Milgram experiment that I think are obviously present and play significant roles. So, condition number six, make sure the subject starts the situation voluntarily. Make sure that they feel like they freely started into this institution and you didn't force them. This is significant. When, does we, when did we see this make a big difference? Vietnam. In Vietnam, when you went from voluntary soldiers to conscripted soldiers during the draft, obedience dropped drastically. In fact, this is when you saw, if you haven't heard about this, sorry for how macabre this is, you saw what was called fragging. What this meant was people were given duties and sometimes they acted on these duties and what would happen at night when they were told they had to keep doing it? Soldiers would throw fragmentation grenades into the officer's tents. This became a thing that was repeated. You keep giving me these terrible duties that I, where I have to do terrible things and watch my buddies die? Well, you're going to die. This was a key difference when it came to the draft. 
Finally, condition number seven, escalate the harm slowly. Notice, you don't have teachers come in and you say, okay, first wrong answer, you're going to shoot them. You first have a little shock, and then you have a little more shock. Do most institutions know that if they're going to ask for cruelty, they're going to have to escalate slowly? Do we know that the military understands this? At the very first day of training, you don't start shooting and beating up other people. No way. You learn cadences. You learn how to march. You shoot at targets. Then you maybe bayonet a dummy that looks a little bit more like a human. We know that you have to escalate harm slowly. Otherwise, people realize the full impact of what they're doing. So, what's the key question? Of course, I'm going to ask, how often are these conditions present in our everyday social lives? Of course, these conditions could be present almost any time. All you have to do is take a religious group, take a sports group, take a classroom, take a work situation, and these conditions would be easy to create. So the real question is, I am shocked, is why don't these things happen more often? Why aren't we producing more harms? We can see how easy it would be to make people commit, commit genocide, but why don't they? I think our innate self stops us in a lot of these cases. But please tell me what you think.